This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Glad you're here. For about 10 years in past my ministry, we, uh, in one congregation, we had a Saturday evening worship service, and we called it the 10 to 5 service. That was taken from Hebrews 10, 25, one of the verses we'll look at here today, which says, forsake not the assembling together of the brethren. Uh, in other words, uh, when the body of Christ gets together, come get together. And I just applaud you for being able to be with us today. Glad you're doing it. Um, I, uh, I, I tried to give you an extra hour of sleep, and I feel like I could preach another hour that way. I hope that's okay today as we continue to worship. I want to say welcome to those of you joining us in Armstrong Channel, the Neighborhood Channel. Uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Those on, uh, listening on 99.1, again, however you are joining us today, we are pleased that you're able to be with us. Just a couple things for the good of the body I want to keep before you. Um, tomorrow night, of course, is going to be the packing party for Operation Christmas Child. We'll be down in the Fellowship Hall at 6 o'clock in the evening. Pizza, I believe, will be provided. So I uh, just want to encourage you to, uh, if you could be here for that, do that. Many hands make li uh, work light, so I think that'll be good. Uh, just a few dates that are coming up in the near future. Um, there is a staff parish meeting Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. The trustees that was scheduled for 7 is not going to be meeting. But some of you on the nominating committee, we will be getting together at that time, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Jerome, uh, by the way, charge conference is coming up on a Thursday night. That'll be November the 18th and at 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, our district superintendent, uh, Dennis, uh, will be able to be with us, and, and we're, we're pleased that, that he's able to do it. Of course, Dennis Swineford, make sure you know his last name as well. And finally, Jerome and, and the people of Pleasantville United Methodist Church are making us feel welcome on Sunday night, November the 21st, for a Thanksgiving service. Sunday night, November 21st, Jerome is going to be preaching up at the Pleasantville Church, and uh, we are invited to be part of that, which I think is, uh, is, is an awesome, awesome thing. Having said that, I also know that the, uh, that the flowers that we have gracing the, the, the uh, uh, the chancel area this morning uh, are in memory of, of Beulah Herb. Beulah went to be with Jesus this last week. That, or that service was on Friday morning. And uh, so those flowers, uh, the family has kindly gracious to allow us to have those for this day. Now, if you are ready to prepare uh, uh, for worship, uh, let us be silent and let us be in tune to what God is getting ready to do.
invite you as you're able to stand for the call to worship. There are different gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. God works through different people in different ways, but it is the same God who achieves his purpose through them all. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of him. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life to set others free. We'll turn your hymnals, if, if, if you're using your hymnals, to number 419. I am thine, O Lord.
thank you, Lord. Thank you for all the things that you continue to do, for the blessings with which you use in our lives. Thank you for giving us every opportunity to be able to also bring back to you, using these gifts for your kingdom here and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know if we've said thank you to the choir. I sometimes don't thank you because I get to sing with you, but thank you. If the behavior of any of them gets out of the hand, I'll report that to you immediately, okay? But so far, they're pretty well behaved. Wanted to address the children or any of the younger ones that might be with us or tuning in with us as well. Uh, today is, is what Voice of the Martyrs calls the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And I just wanted to say to my younger friends, can, can you imagine what it would be like to live in a country in which your parents and your church is not allowed to teach you until you're 18 anything about your faith or your religion. Religious instruction cannot be done in many countries until you're 18. And um, we have this blessing of being able to be here. I, uh, I liked it whenever some of our, some of our, our kids who had been back to uh, Kids for Christ would, would say, are we doing something here at the church tomorrow? You know, we have the, the privilege of being able to be here and, uh, and how thankful we are for that. But I want my, my younger friends to know that that's not the case in all countries, not the case in various parts of the world. And uh, so what we're going to do this morning is, is begin to just, just have a time of prayer for the persecuted church, for the people in some of the various parts of the world. And I'm going to lead in prayer. So let's bow our heads as we pray together. God of the world, we come to you. We give you thanks, Lord, for the freedom that we have today. I don't think anyone here, in, 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 at least within the, the ears of my voice, are suffering persecution. Persecution is a word, Lord, that almost gets lost for our youngest of them. But, but whenever we realize that some people suffer from their families if they decide to follow Jesus, some people are ostracized in their community if they follow Jesus. And in some places, the government themselves may put the leaders of, of church or even yourself into jail because, uh, because you have rejected whatever faith that they are wanting you to be part of. And that's called persecution, Lord. And we're asking that you help us to be sensitive to people around the world. So we pray for the, the, we pray for the people that are, are in, in China right at the moment and not allowed, uh, at least not allowed officially to be uh, training young people how they should know about Jesus and what they should know about him. We pray for some of the people in, in Eritrea, in, in Africa, who, who may be in jail right now and, and being held in shipping containers, even in desert type of weather, uh, and, the, and the struggle that they must be going through right at the moment. And we ask that you would let those people know your love. We pray for the people in, in some of the Middle Eastern countries, that the pastors that aren't even sure when they're in jail that anybody is even praying for them. And help them to know, Lord, that they are being lifted up by you. We want to pray for men and women and boys and girls in, in Afghanistan. Uh, now that the Taliban has, has taken over once again, uh, knowing that, that some of them risk life and limb just in order to, to remain faithful to you. We pray for fellow uh, believers, those who love you, Jesus, who, who may have to give accountability for the faith that they talk about, or for women who are not able to, to, um, to take their place in society the way, uh, the way we believe you have designed it to take place. We pray for the members of the Taliban. Usually we just speak anger and sometimes vitriol, but they are your creation, Lord, and I know that you desire for them to come to know you. So we're asking that since in so much of the, the Islamic world that you keep showing up to people in visions and, uh, and, and, and you, Jesus, appear to them in dreams, we ask that you do that with the members of the Taliban. And even whenever one person does come to you, um, 
that you would protect that person because their life will be in danger as they do respond to you. We pray for the, um, for the very people that, 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 that they belong to, um, that one after another would come to know you. Most of all, Lord, I, I want to ask that you would allow us to be sensitive to them and not forget to be praying for them. And for all children within the, the ears of, of, of what I'm praying right at the moment, we give you thanks for our freedom and, and help us to not take that for granted, Lord, but to be caring about those who do not have what we are able to have. So we simply ask that you be present with them, that you release the captives, and that you allow people to be able to, uh, be able to breathe the freedom of following you. All this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, today we're talking about the, the blood of Jesus and the ultimate sacrifice that he made for you and me. And a song that, that many of you sang growing up, we don't use it nearly often enough, I don't believe anymore, is Just As I Am, verses 1, 2, 3, and 5. Remain seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the Lamb of God. We do come. We come as individuals and as a congregation. We come, Lord, because we celebrate these first Sundays of each month. And we have an opportunity to be able to gather together and to celebrate communion. What a sacrament you've given us, that we are able to confess those things which we might have done that are inappropriate, things that are not godly, but to also give you the praise for the blessings we've been able to celebrate and the good things we have done with one another. 
And Lord, we just ask that you would help us each day of our lives to be more kind, to be more compassionate, and to care for one another and lift each other up. Lord, we think about the little one in Madison. We ask that you be with her as she heals from her surgery. We ask for those that have gone through losses like Leah Onley and the loss of her older brother. We ask that you be with her. And we know there are many congregations where they are dealing with COVID. And we lift them up and ask that you heal them and help them to be whole. We thank you for our first responders and our doctors and our hospitals. Lord, we thank you that our local nursing home has opened up and that we're able to see one another and to just touch one another. It's so important to be able to have this relationship, not only with family members, but also with you. Draw us closer to you, Lord. Help us to have that personal relationship as you grow towards communion, help us to know that the sacrifice you did for each one of us was because of your great love. And Lord, we thank you for that, and we thank you for your prayer that you pull us together and allow us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture this morning is taken from Letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10. I want to begin in verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and, and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I have a picture here of a, a barber pole, red, white, and blue. Any place where you see that symbol, if the, if the doors are still open, if the doors are open in some shape or form, you can guarantee you're going to find someone in there with a pair of scissors and a comb, and, uh, and you can get your hair cut. Of course, we haven't forgotten that there was a time when you could do a lot more at a barber shop. You could get your teeth extracted, you could uh, see a doctor in that, in that process. Um, and uh, I, uh, I, I think of this sometimes with, with, with Brother Zayner, I almost would like to have a big barber pole outside your place sometimes and, and uh, see how he does with cutting hair, to be honest with you. He's got steady hands, he might be able to do that. But, you know, the, until about 1745, I think the Surgeon's Guild and the Barber's Guild were the same thing. And so all these services would be done. And, uh, had been, and one of the things that they would do an awful lot would be bloodletting. If you had a sore throat 
or if you had the plague. Uh, they would use bloodletting many times. And, uh, and, and I'd like to say, you think guys avoid the doctor now. Can you imagine what it had been like in those days as they would do just that? Um, but I do know this, that, that red, I believe, at least in, in the one website I was looking at, the, you know, it's not anything to do with the flag, but the red is, is for the blood, white is for the bandages, and the blue is for the veins. And, uh, and of course, the veins is where a lot of the bloodletting would take place. I simply want to bring that, that to you and talk about that today because it represents uh, how blood has been a part of life all the time. We, we cringe a little bit when we talk about blood. And by the way, when I described bloodletting, did, did you see anyone lay down on their pew and pass out whenever I was describing that? Uh, if they are, give them some time, they'll come back, uh, I hope, uh, when we do that. So if you would just picture this way, I, I use this in order to bring up the conversation about the, the blood sacrifices that was used by Israel, by all Jews, by, uh, in temple and uh, in, in temple life in order for their forgiveness of sin. And you know, you know, and I'll just repeat this well, uh, but whenever, uh, whenever desired forgiveness would take place, you would present yourself to the temple and offer a, maybe a, 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 a bull or a, or a goat or a bird, offer some type of sacrifice. And when the blood was shed from that animal, that blood was used, uh, blood was used in order to, to symbolically cover your sin and forgiveness would be able to take place. The good news about all this is that when Jesus came and, and they described him as a priest, when he offers his blood sacrifice there on the cross, when he offered his blood sacrifice, it was once and for all. So in the Day of Atonement, if you can picture the Day of Atonement in, in, in the Jewish faith, uh, was, was of course once a year, and, and there would be for, uh, desire to be forgiven from all the sins uh, that, that year and in the past. And uh, whenever that was done, then they would need to renew that again next year. That's what was different with Jesus. It was once and for all. Uh, I was able to sit in on a service one time that is very memorable to me, in which the, uh, it was a, a conference with a lot of pastors. So what do, you do, what do you do when you preach to pastors whenever they think they've heard it all? They haven't, by the way, but we think we have. So what do you do with that? Uh, so what they did was they described the Day of Atonement to them. And uh, they had, the, uh, had a priest come out. He came out in all his uh, vestments. They, uh, he came out with long hair and they shaved his head. Uh, they did all kinds of things to prepare him to go into the Holy of Holies and also to prepare him to be able to take on the sins of the world. They, they brought a goat out and they showed how that the hands would have been placed on the, on the goat and, and with the sins of, of the nation upon that and then the goat cast out into, uh, you know, in, into the, in the desert places. But what was so unique about that was that we learned that, that on the Day of Atonement, whenever all the sacrifice had been made and, and the process were done, whenever the priest had done everything he needed to do for the forgiveness, the priest would sit down. And when the priest would sit down was the rejoicing of the nation because at that point he sat down, the work of atonement, the work of forgiveness, the blood sacrifice was complete. And so the forgiveness for all was, was truly had at that point. It was a wonderful thing. The scripture that I've just read to you says that Jesus, who is the forever priest, so to speak, and the forever forgiver, Jesus, whenever he had completed his, meaning death on the cross, and the resurrection take place, when he was done, when, when all that was done, he sat down beside God, or sat down beside the Father, and sat at his right hand side. Now you and I teach one another, he sits on the right hand side of God, and he intercedes on our behalf. But when the priest would sit down in Jewish thing, that was the signal for everyone to rejoice because forgiveness had taken place. And when Jesus sits down beside our Lord and, or our God, when he sits down there, it's symbolic of the fact that once and for all, your sins are forgiven. Some of you have been with me on, on Easter Sundays when we celebrate the resurrection, and, and I'll ask you to cheer for the resurrection the way you cheer for your favorite ball team or the way you cheer for, for a political contest of some kind. And, and, and you've done it before. You've stood with me, and, and, and you cheer. And if you don't do it well enough, I've had to do it again so that you would 
enthusiastically cheer about, about the resurrection the, the way that you would cheer about some other thing in life so that we wouldn't be cheating on that. I did this in one church a long time ago, by the way, and we weren't sure that people would get to, with the program, so we pumped in music from a football stadium, or sound from a football stadium in order to really pump up the sound, and, and it worked. People got louder as they heard other people cheering. I'm not going to do that today, so relax. But what I do want you to understand is that when Jesus paid the price, your sins are forgiven, not for the next year, not for the past year, uh, but for all time forward and all time in the past. That sacrifice of Jesus is not like that of a bull and a goat. Well, we're using the idea of the barbershop as just an example of, of uh, how how men have traditionally gone, particularly in these recent years, men have traditionally gone to the barber and conversation takes place and there's learning. I got a picture of Cedric the Entertainer here and, uh, and, and he was in the movie Barbershop. Now, I am not endorsing that movie at all. I'm not saying you should even go watch it. It's 20 years old. Uh, there's plenty more to watch instead of that. But I do remember one of the speeches he gave and I was able to find a, uh, I was able to find the, um, the account of, of what he had said in that speech. And he, he was really having it out with the young guys in his shop. And he was trying to explain to them that, that his generation uh, got their style and got their, their lessons on how to live in life and how to dress in life from the barbers. They were the keepers of the style. Listen to what he said. See, in my day, a barber was more than just somebody who sat around in a FUBU shirt. Do you know what a FUBU shirt is? Uh, it, it you know, stands for for us bias. It comes out of the hip-hop hip -hop community. And the only reason I know that is I had to look it up, okay? Uh, with his drawers hanging out. And in my day, a barber was a counselor. He was a fashion expert, a style coach, just general all-around hustler. But the problem with y'all cats today is that you got no skill, no sense of history. And then with a straight face, got to nerve to, to want to be somebody. Uh, and, and want somebody to respect you. But it takes respect to get respect. Understand? See, I'm old, but Lord willing, I'd be spared the sight of seeing everything that we worked for flushed down the drain by someone who don't know no better or care. He saw in his world and his culture the need to be a standard a need to be able to help the young people who needed to be able to help to understand lives as they have it. There's a, there are barbershops right at the moment that are putting something called the, called, uh, the project, or Confess Project. And Confess Project is a, is a thing where, where the, the barber shops are training, or the barber school is training them to set up shops and by all means to cut hair, not to do any bloodletting, but to be a bit of a counselor type of place. Now I've been in a lot of barber shops in my day. And I don't know that I've always gotten good counsel when I'm in there, but I do find people speaking rather honestly in that particular setting. Enough, and, and when they see the preacher come in, they like being more honest than usual, I think, whenever they catch that. And so it's just very interesting to watch this take place. But it does help define what, what a general consensus of manhood is and, and, and the way uh, people are to behave in some shape or form. They may be way out in left field, but they're coming to some type of agreement. The Confess Project is trying to help people in their health care, trying to help men uh, get, uh, get, get checkups, trying to help them be able to know how to, how to deal with things going on in their marriage. They really are working like counselors in some of these. So th this particular project has barbershops in 14 states and about 150 different barbershops doing that. Isn't that what we're doing here at the church? We don't have any barbershop sign out in front of us, but we are definitely a place where men and women, young people, children, where, where we have the opportunity to be able to give counsel, to encourage, and to help them understand that confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior is the way to handle the fact that Jesus paid this ultimate sacrifice. Look at uh, verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place um, by the blood of Jesus, let me just stop, by the way. 
I don't know how, how aware you are of the, of the docile that, that's up here. This church has one of the most beautiful ones I've, I've ever known. And it's interesting, this late in my ministry, uh, in, my, in my years of serving, I've got to enjoy that because my home church where I grew up had one, not nearly as big as that. And it was only one color. It was really a, a purple color, a deep red, I guess. And, uh, and I can still remember being four or five years old on the very first service in that sanctuary. I saw that curtain up there and uh, I could not wait till service was over and I needed to get up there and peek behind that curtain, see what that was. But it represents entry into the Holy of Holies, the place where only God resided and only the high priest could go for the, for, for the forgiveness of sins for the whole nation. And, uh, and what we've noticed in Kids for Christ, and I heard him asking Jerome again this on Wednesday, what's behind that thing? And uh, I, they're going to be terrifically disappointed when they peek back here, by the way. It's very unexciting. But we have the opportunity to teach to them that it was the Holy Holy, that the priest only went in there once a year. And when the priest would go in and come back out, um, essentially as the process would take place, their sins would be forgiven. Um, so that's 19, verse 20. Uh, I've already said, placed by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great perfect, a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled uh, to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed and purify or pure water with pure water. So you get this idea, um, you, you know, the blood sprinkle that, that harkens back to the sacrifice when, when the, the blood would, would be there and, and they would dip a, a hyssop branch, sometimes for water, sometimes for blood, and would just spray that out as, uh, as the forgiveness was being offered to those who are around and part of that sacrifice. Jesus does this in a final way. It's really, uh, it, I, I know this is probably something that many of you have understood for a long time, but I just thought we needed to remind ourselves of this one more time, that, that, that Jesus' sacrifice was not like the bulls, was not like the goats and the rams. Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all, and he now sits at the Father. That means that whenever you and I have confessed our sin and have asked for forgiveness, invited him to be the leader of our lives, uh, Jesus now sits at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. That our forgiveness goes back all of our lives. Our forgiveness, uh, you know, I'm just thinking, Nancy, Will's probably going to do something wrong today. D don't tell us about it, but he probably will, you know. And I just want you to know that he's forgiven. Thanks, Will, for acknowledging that. Uh, it, he's forgiven for whatever happens today. He may have to say, I'm sorry, but he's forgiven. When Jesus paid that price for him, he's prayed for once and for all, forever and ever and ever. Um, I always like the idea, and this is, this is really an appropriate answer right now, but Jesus gives booster shots as well, okay? In other words, whenever we, we blow it sometimes, and, and uh, we blow it sometimes, and we've entered back into, into some of the mistakes that we've done. He, he, uh, he welcomes us to come and confess that once again, but the price has already been paid. I have a picture here of my son Micah sitting in a barber shop. I took this about two years ago. In fact, I showed this two years ago here in the, in the sermon. It says, I know no one can remember one week later what I preached on. I know you're not going to remember this. But here it was from two years ago. And he, uh, Micah was, I had to take Micah to the airport in Pittsburgh. And he said, Dad, on the way, I'd like to stop at Ambridge. Well, that's in the right direction, but it's not really a very quick stop to, to turn off and go down into Ambridge. But we went down to Ambridge because his friend John had a barbershop there. And he wanted me to see how John cares for that. We walked into it. In fact, he has it set up in the basement of a church uh, that he rents space from. And uh, so we went into this barbershop. On the right-hand side, he had a lot of chairs for people to sit and to talk. And on the other side, there was a big big um, space in between or, or a barrier in between where he was and where they were, uh, he would cut hair and talk with everyone in the shop. And I, I just laughed. I, I, I've not had very many lofty conversations in the barbershop before. I've had a lot of conversations, but some of them made me blush, to be honest with you. And, and so it's an, always an interesting thing to me. And I go into this barbershop, and here's what I always say about my son Micah. He, he hangs out with the charismatics. 
So everything is demonstrative and they're pertinent and they do it really, really well. But these guys were really caring in their conversation and they involved any of us who were sitting there. And, you know, I'm a good mainline Protestant person. I know that you're religious in church and you just smile and be very polite when you're in public. You know how that goes. Because we would never want to make fools of ourselves in any shape or form. And in that particular place, it wasn't long before I'm praying with them out loud. And, and it was awesome. And he was just involved in everybody. This young man who, who cuts hair has, has been a missionary for a couple of years. He's come back and he set up a barber shop in the basement of a church and he uses it to cut hair and minister to people. Well, that's who we are as a church, by the way. Um, I wanted to read a little bit more in chapter 10. Um, I stopped where we stopped, but I wanted now to, to, to read the, the last part. And so I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to verse 23 here. And I want you to hear these, these words as this passage continues on here. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For we, or for he who promised is faithful. And by the way, that hope is that we're forgiven once and for all. That's, that's, that's context here, okay? And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So I've been able to identify about three things in that passage that I want to leave with you here this morning. One of them being this. Uh, hold fast to our confession. If I can have that next slide on it, there we go. Uh, holding fast to our confession. In other words, know that you have been forgiven. Know that the price has been paid for you. We're going to take communion here in just a while. And when we take communion, we remember how Jesus' body was broken and how his blood was poured out for us. Hold fast to that confession. Um, and, and, and remember what, you know, remember what we learned from, from Jesus, that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly and that we might have eternal life. So all that is part of their confession. And then provoking one another, not meaning in a negative way, but in a positive way, which would be provoking one another to, to do good works, to do the right thing, to, to, um, to, to help take care of other people, to help feed the hungry. To, you get the idea, to do all those kind of things. And finally, thirdly in that passage, is to meet together and encourage one another. I began the service by talking about the 1025 service. Forsake not the assembling together of the brethren. And, and what, that, what that has always meant, whenever you are faithfully able to be here, whenever you gather together in worship, in your Bible studies, in your Sunday school classes, for choir, for music rehearsals, for sewing machine, uh, sewing team that gathers on Tuesday mornings. One thing we do after another, uh, when we meet together and encourage one another, it's a great thing. You remember how we used to hear the, hear the little, little rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? I, I found that to not be true in life. I found that people's words hurt me a lot. And I know that I've hurt other people with my words. Possibly before I'm out of here today, I might, I might hurt someone, and I don't mean to, but I just know we do. Our words have a way of sticking in people in a way that either detracts from their life, literally a kind of a road to death, so to speak, or builds up in such a way and encourages such a way and, and is life-giving. Meeting together and encourage one another. Uh, are you practicing a kind word, an encouraging word, a way of hope for some of the ones in which you have conversation with? Um, are, you, are, you, are you working on that? Because that's exactly what we have the opportunity to do in this particular church that you and I are part of. I uh, maybe wanted to wrap it up by, by sharing this thing that, that was written by uh, James Thyron. It's set up like a, like a prescription. This would be a good prescription for you to see in your doctor's office at any time. It goes like this. Um, do you suffer from moderate to severe sin? The chronic condition occurs in 100% of humans, by the way. You may be plagued by symptoms such as doing things you swore you'd never do, or saying things you were determined not to say, or leaving undone tasks that you promised to do, or holding your tongue when there was a good word to share. 
Some patients have reported hurting people they, they love with thoughtless words uh, or applying negative labels to people they don't know, encouraging behaviors their mothers told them to avoid. If you suffer from one or more of these complaints, um, uh, then consult Jesus of Nazareth, who is known to have said, those who are well have no need for a physician, and those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. So here's the prescription. It includes recognition that God is forgiving, that he offers repentance, uh, he encourages confession of sin, and a follow-up course on forgiveness as well for whenever you blow it later on. Ask your local pastor if you can join in prayer, praying these kind of prayers. Well, I think that's exactly what we ought to do. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, I have spoken words I should not have spoken. I have been silent at times whenever a kind word would have encouraged and built up. I have done some things my mother told me not to do. And I have avoided other things that she asked me to do. I confess my sin. I am not confused, Lord. I know that you have already paid the price for my sin. Cleanse me, Lord. Take away that sin. Jesus, I picture you sitting on the right-hand side of God, interceding on my behalf. Bring healing. When we take communion in just a moment, Lord, we'll continue to, to, to confess sin. But when we take that communion a little bit, help us to remember the brokenness of your body, the pouring out of your blood, but not like that of blood and bulls, to be done again and again and again and again. But once and for all, our sins are laid bare and covered by the blood of Jesus. This is our confession, Lord. You are Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Of course, in the United Methodist Church, we have an open communion. We, tell you, we remind each other that all the time. Um, if you are truly and earnestly repenting from sin and desiring to live in fellowship with people like us that are right here, the body of Christ, then the invitation to you is, is, is to come and receive the sacrament. Uh, we do not require membership. We do not require an age limit. But as you begin to understand the sacrifice Christ has made for you, you are welcome to share in this particular body. We're going to continue in prayer for a little bit for whatever confession you may be making. And I just invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes and make private confession to God. When you're forgiven, your sins are thrown away as far as the east is from the west. Into the depths of the sea, the ocean, never to be returned again. Thanks be to God for his final, complete, and perfect sacrifice for you and me. It was on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, 
said, this is my body, which is given for you. Likewise, after supper, he lifted up the cup. He said, this cup is the New Testament of my blood for the remission of sin. As often as you drink this, you remember Jesus till he comes again. Let's pray. Lord, we consecrate these elements. There's so much theology and so much differences one church after another. But in our tradition, Lord, we understand that you do something amazingly transformative in our bodies when we set apart the cup, um, the grape juice and the bread. We set it apart, we consecrate it, we ask that you make it holy uh, in such a way that when we eat and drink this, it, it encourages us in our, our statement of faith, our confession of, of who you are and, and what we believe, and that we use it for fellowship with one another. Make these items holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you're coming in, hopefully you received a cup. Is there anyone who, who did not get their communion elements? If you raise your hand, we'll try to, to get to you. Very good. Wondered if you would take the top lid, the cellophane, from the wafer, if you just remove that at this time. Find the wafer. Let's show it. Huh? Let's let me see it. This is the body of Christ broken for you and me. Eat in Thanksgiving. Of course, after supper, he lifted up the cup. If you remove that lid, you don't need to lift up the cup very hard. You want to keep it all inside the cup for the moment here, okay? The cup of Jesus for the remission of sin poured out for you and me. Drink in remembrance of Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, as we close the table, we remember your sacrifice for us and it blesses us. Help us as we confess you as Lord and Savior. Help us as we fellowship with one another. Let us be bold and know when to speak and let us be silent and know when to be silent. But you and your presence, Lord, Go with us. Amen. We're going to have you stand, if you will to number 174. His name is wonderful. Maybe we can sing it twice. This is our confession.
I found it a privilege to share the sacrament with every one of you. Now go in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take care.